the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. The next song talks about the metaphor for Christ's atonement for sin. In stanza one, the sustaining nature of Christ's blood shed way back on Calvary indicates that the initial experience of salvation continues to give strength from day to day. The power of Christ's blood is with us in the pinnacle of our lives and well in the midst of all our life's deepest distress. Let us sing, the blood will never lose its power. in Jesus. So many obstacles and trials, but with all of this, we are going through this all with him. Let's sing, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I had many tears and sorrows had questions for tomorrow there have been times I didn't know right from wrong but in every situation God gave me consolation that my trials come to only make me strong through I've learned 
to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all. Through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. I've been to lots of places and I've seen a lot. I felt so all alone But in my lonely hours Yes, those precious lonely hours Jesus lets me know That I was His own Through it all Through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus, I've learned to trust in God, through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. I thank God for the mountains, and I thank Him for the valley. I thank Him for the storms He brought me through. For if I'd never had a problem, I wouldn't know God can solve them. I've never known what faith in God could do. Let us all stand and sing our team song, O Christian, Awake.
Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life this afternoon. Thank you for the lunch break that we've had, and thank you for the privilege to once again hear you speak to us. We pray as your man servant comes to speak to your children. May you speak to him and through him for the glory and honor of your name. May you bring us all into one accord as you draw us near to the cross of Calvary. All may be in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We welcome you to this afternoon session. We invite all of you to be with us as we begin the prophecy session. Uh, preacher Karibu. It's another privilege to have this session running, and I got some questions put in our lesson yesterday. It was such a difficult lesson, and yet some of you are willing and ready to follow and even ask genuine questions. And the genuine questions will get genuine answers. I will try to answer some of them. Somebody says, is it wrong to use the power of the devil to heal somebody who is suffering from disease when we see that the Lord has relief, comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy? The devil does not heal. He can masquerade. He can create situations of sickness, but the devil does not heal. The person who heals is the Lord Jesus. And so if you see he is delayed, learn to wait a little bit. He will unlock chapter 16, verse 24. Please explain it. And I prepared something here to help us explain. Look chapter 16, verse 24. I would like you to read it. And one of the things you want to train yourself to do is not read one verse or take it out of context. So what I will do with the verse is to extrapolate in its context what the Jews were asking Jesus and Jesus' response. This is the classical parable of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Us. Now somebody has asked about it and we must answer. You know we can't run away from any genuine question. Ask it, we will answer. Well, some of you have heard that story. Jesus told that story to the Pharisees. Look at why he told that story first of all before you start reading the story. Now Jesus said to them, that is the Pharisees, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So the Pharisees had some doctrines that the dead would live on. They would ask funny questions like, what if somebody dies and they, they didn't give birth to a child and there are seven brothers? You know, those imaginary questions around the dead and they knew the Sadducees had a conflict with the straight of the dead, the Pharisees also. But the Bible correctly teaches that the dead are in their grave. So Jesus, he, he said to them, a parable. I want you to look at that parable. He said, tradition is something you lift up. It's an abomination. So this story of this rich man and Lazarus is an example of a highly esteemed doctrine that the Pharisees were teaching and were, you know, they, they lifted up this story. Now before I can read that story and extrapolate three reasons why I think that story is a parable, you will notice from the Bible commentary uh, the Companion Study Bible, it says, this commences the second part of the Lord's address to the Pharisees against their tradition, making void God's word as to the dead. That means God has a standard and a word regarding the dead. It's not called a parable, but it's, it cites a notable example of the Pharisees' tradition which had been brought from Babylon. So you can see where they got it. They picked it up from Egypt and now they had come up along with it. So the question we need to answer in this uh, parable, is this a literal story or it is a parable? Now there are four reasons why you want to say this is not a literal story and it is a parable. First of all, Abraham's bosom is mentioned in the story. Question, how big is Ab Abraham's bosom that everyone who dies goes there? That's the first question I'll ask. So if it's a literal story, then we know that Abraham's bosom is not the place where all the dead goes. If Abraham's bosom is literal, for the, uh, a literal abode for the saved, 
then it means Abraham must have a very big bosom and obviously that is not the truth. The second thing is there is a conversation going on between the dead, those who are in hell and those who are in heaven. Honestly, when you're in hell, you won't be talking to anyone. And I don't know how you think how near they are to each other. There is incidentally no normal conversation that can go on between the burning and those who are not burning. Now the third reason is why this story cannot be literal is because those who are in hell do not have literal bodies. Uh, we know his eyes and tongue and you know all those things. We can see, uh, I don't know who teaches that literal bodies when they die here they go to heaven or they go to hell straight. It must be the Pharisees and the men who believe that the dead are not in their grave. The final reason why I'll tell you this story is not literal but parabolic the guy in hell is asking for a drop of water. Friends, if you're in hell, you should be asking for a sea of water if that can quench your tongue. Your tongue. But the truth is this. Hell will be so hot that you won't even need water. It won't, it, it, you know, right now we think it's, it's, it's a small thing. But the day you reach there, you'll realize death will change everything. School won't be important. So I ask you to take seriously the lessons you are learning today. Another question here is, you've just shown us the qualities identifying the true church. Are they qualities given by God? If yes, which Bible chapter and which verse? Uh, how can I know and, be prove, and prove them from the Bible? Revelation 12 is where I got all that list. Revelation 12 tells of this woman clothed with the moon, and you see the woman is a representation of the church, and she runs away from the dragon. The dragon is the devil. Then she goes away for 1360 years into the wilderness, then shows up, and the characteristic of that woman can be linked with the church of the apostles. So you can do Revelation 12, Revelation 14, and the teachings of Jesus, and you'll find a good list of the character and the, the attributes of uh, Real, uh, the true church. Can a person be baptized more than seven times? Well, you don't take baptism as something that you do every other time you feel like and you don't make serious commitment, that will be turned into swimming. But if you were baptized in the way that the Bible doesn't sanction, you need to be rebaptized. Also, if you are baptized in a commandment breaking church, you need to be rebaptized. The Bible talks about rebaptism, Acts chapter 9 talks about that. The last question, two last that are looking related, and they will launch us into today's interesting session. I am sure you today's session is interesting. Let me just post it up there. Then I can. Is it there, by the way? Where did it go? Okay, they will find it. I, I'm just going to deal with this. The questions that you bring, please hold them here so that we don't have the up and a down movement. I will pick them at the end because I'll answer them. Okay that the water used in the Catholic and Legio Maria is connected to the liquid from the frog in prophecy. <laughs> I will show you that. Please listen keenly. That's why I read that question. Good questions indeed. The other one is, back in our church, we do we call on the name of Mary to pray for us. Preacher, make me understand, why do we call on the name of Mary? Friends, the truth is this. Many churches are gone into apostasy and they have picked up relics of paganism including the calling of mary who i will declare in this session a little bit more so i would like you to join me in prayer as we start and i wanted to sit well today's session is one that is going to be hotter than any subject you have ever had please write some notes confirm these things and if you have anything you can post your question there and we will reach out and answer your questions I saw that a lot of you made decisions for baptism when it is online. You can keep doing that. Let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, the message today is urgent and serious. So I ask that your spirit will attend this message. Just sample my words and guide the listening and lead us to your truth and into way everlasting. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, yesterday we learned that there are counterfeit gifts and there are counterfeit prophets and there are false teachers and they show great signs and great wonders and with one purpose to deceive. You remember? 
The, the, the issue was mirror the law and the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. And we say the Bible teaches on the state of the dead. We looked at that. We say the Bible teaches the dead are asleep. They are in their grave. They don't know anything. And they don't return to their homes. And they are not in hell burning. And the Bible Sabbath is Saturday. That was all. The devil can work miracles. We read that. We said he does great wonders. In fact, in, he causes fire to come down from heaven and the means of fire is to cause miracles so that people can be deceived and we left it at a point where we were talking about the counterfeit fire and we saw in Pentecost Acts chapter 2 there was a genuine fire symbolizing the Holy Spirit which was poured in great power and as an answer uh, as, as a a follow-up of God's promise, he said, you shall receive power. And this power was to give them the ability to speak in tongues. And when they spoke in tongues, people could hear them. You can see the Bible says, they, and I was the one with the spirit of tongues. I would be speaking Kalenjin and the Kalenjin men would hear what I'm saying. And another guy would be speaking Luo and the Luo men would hear what I'm saying. ETC, ETC. And they could tell that they are magnifying the name of the Lord. And we concluded by saying the Holy Ghost came on them and they prophesied. So the work of speaking in tongues is to prophesy. And that is exactly what I am doing right now. And the Bible even warns us not to use tongues if it is not to communicate or to teach the truth. If you can't speak in easy things, avoid it. And we left off by saying, if you have the gift of tongues, use it to teach. I have a video here that I don't know, I didn't allot the team there. But I think if you can find that video, I'm coming to it in a short while. Please make it ready. I will play it from here. Try to play it along with me. If not possible, I'll put the mic. Uh, can I? I can put the mic here. I'll see what, what will happen. Okay. So there's a, a surgeons, an insurgence of speaking in tongues in many of the commandment breaking churches. Uh, somebody moved it for me. <laughs> okay. Maybe he has stopped thinking about it. Uh, but the truth is. The commandments are still important to God. And here's a video clip. I don't know if I wish it could be played for me. There is a video clip I came with here. Let me see. I can have it played. Just wait. We will have it played. I wanted to listen to it. If I can get the audio, I will play it for you. Of people speaking in tongues. Because it's a good illustration of what you see today. What the men of today think is uh, religion. Let me just see. I can do that like that. And then I can do this. Let me see. Oh. Ah, fuck, Bianca. Fire! 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 Oh. Oh. That's glorious. Fire on ya! Fire on ya, kid. Right. Look at this on your young people. Look at this anointing on your young people. And some of you think that that is the Holy Spirit working. That is Benny Hinn with his fire movement. I think we need to comment on that. And I will not let that go without a serious, genuine, biblical comment. Let me see if we can come back here. Yes, we can. We can come back here and move on. You've just seen an example of counterfeit fire. This is not the Holy Spirit working. And when people fall on the ground and they ride, that is demon possession. If you don't know, by the way. When people fall like that, it's demon possession. Benny Hinn doesn't teach people to keep the Sabbath. And more than that, he communicates with the spirit of the dead, which the Bible condemns. I want to read for you from one of his interviews here. Here is he, he says... When I was a little boy, I saw the Lord in this dream. It was really, it was so real. Let me just see, I think uh, I may not get some of my slides looking nice later. Let me just put this to look good. Yeah, now it will. So this is an interview in 1997. He said that it was, when he was a little boy, he saw the Lord in his dream. It was so real, it was a vision. So they see visions. Because when he appeared to me, my body became electric. 
Look at the interview. He said, just like electricity went through me, and when I walk, when I awoke, that electricity was still in my body. Well, anyway, in this one, in this vision that I saw, can you read what he's saying? I saw Miss Kuhlman, and she said, follow me, question, 1997, where was Miss Catherine Kuhlman? Very dead, a long time ago, and who was she? A faith healer, and she is telling a preacher today who has multiple, many people in his congregation following that he speaks with the dead, and the dead tells them, follow. And friends, the question is, is it possible for someone to think that they are using God's power, but instead they are actually using the devil's power? That's an important that says to me, Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father in heaven. Then Jesus comes to them and says, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied. That is Benihin and his team. We in your name, and we have cast out demons in your name. And how many are those? Many. And then the Lord will say, I never knew you. Why? It's because they were not using God's power. If they were using God's power, Jesus would have known about it. So friends, there is another kind of supernatural power they are using. It is the devil's power. And the Bible says, by their fruits you will know them if they do the will of God. Let's return to the story I told you yesterday. I told you I'll finish it today. I'm ready to finish it. You remember the story of the three girls? The story of Fatima? I hope you read it at night, did you? Well, we left it on July 13, 1917. On that date, the shining woman came and gave Mary a vision of hell. Are you listening? Through the world. Question. Does this agree with the Bible? Can I see your answer this way or that way? Does this agree with the Bible? That poor sinners are in hell and they can be saved from hell by praying to them or praying for them? You can see here, friends, there is some power. Now, 500 people actually were there that day, and they saw it. And this thing was recorded on secular newspaper. Now, the next month, let, 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 let the story roll. The next month, this was August 13, 15,000 people came to cover the era, and they were seeing this shining lady. And this time, they saw a globe of light across the heaven from the east to the oak tree. You remember the oak tree? Now, on, seven, on September 13, enthusiasm was so high, the numbers that were coming to see this woman, she was keen coming back monthly. 30,000 people came to the same place, cover their era. Again, they saw a globe of light across the heaven, settle on the oak tree. By this time, they saw also shining petals like snowflakes coming to the ground. And the shining woman said, I will come back next month. And that was the biggest showdown. Now, the next time she came was October, the month where we are in. It was raining, and people came, 75,000 of them down there in, uh, in, in, in Portugal, and they went to see the miracle. After the woman had conversed with the children, she stretched her hands towards the sun, and people, she actually blocked the sun until people could look at the sun without any, you know, uh, any need of aid. You know, the sun, you can't look at it direct. So rays of light were seen from the sun with different colors radiating from the sun. And then the sun turned into silver disc and colors began radiating out of the sun in all directions. Next, the sun started turning on its axis like a meteorite or something like that. Then it started jumping back and forth. The sun started jumping up back and forth in the sky. And finally, it appeared that the sun was going to fall on them. And these guys were so terrified, they thought the sun was colliding with the earth. Here is a real picture of uh, the 75,000 people. They saw this miracle. And Are you following the story? Because the lady had instructed, pray to Mary that were soaked in the rain in a moment right now had been dry completely and the ground was covered by about 10 centimeters of water and it was an undeniable miracle. What a miracle. But friends, I want to analyze it a little bit today and tell you about the Babylon's principle that works from the powers of the devil. The question is, let's, let, let's get the question here. Who did the miracle? Do you want to know? 
Well, to answer that question, we look at some of the doctrines of Mary and other apparitions. Here is one of them. One of the doctrines you find is prayer and sacrifice for the dead. Let's read a statement from the shining woman who claims to be Mary. She says, pray a great deal and make sacrifice, sacrifices for sinners for many souls go to hell for not having someone to pray and make sacrifices for them. Question. Who makes sacrifices for people? It's Jesus, is that right? His sacrifice was sufficient, wasn't it? Why should you again come back and pray? According to this woman, Jesus' sacrifice is not enough and you must be enjoying that sacrifice. Another doctrine of Fatima and the, the other Marian apparatus the Bible. Purgatory is a fabrication of the father of lies, the devil. And he said that you shall not surely die. So he didn't know what to do with those who die sinful. So he places them somewhere and cheats them. You know, this thing of purgatory is such a deadly disease because if you knew that you can live the way you like, and when you die, people come and pray for you. You don't have to receive Jesus. It doesn't matter what you do in the flesh because someone can pray for you. And friends, let me tell you the truth. If you don't make decisions called Babylon, that system, the Bible calls it Babylon. And that's why they make too much noise. They are babbling. And the confusion began all the way down in Genesis 11 when those men started building a tower towards heaven. They didn't believe God's word. And when they reached up, God said, let's go and confound them or confuse them. And that place was called Babel. That's why today when you hear people babbling, you can tell they have a spirit of confusion of tongues. My question today, and I'll finish with this question, who or what is Babylon? Do you want to know? No? This is, I know some of you are expecting, but that Bible of yours, Revelation is not at the end. Yes, I have some books of commentary at the end, but Revelation is here, 17. Can you find your Revelation? Confirm, please check on your preachers. Today, people, I wonder, you go to church and you hear a preacher quoting Second Goliath, and people are looking. Second Goliath. That's why they are deceived. They know too much about the, the football matches. But they don't know about the Bible and the gospel. They think the epistles are wives of the apostles. Let's leave that. Revelation 17, the Bible says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, and saying, Come hither, I will show you the judgment of the great whore, or the great harlot, which sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made to drunk with the have been made drunk with the wine of halfcation. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman who has done a little bit of Bible prophecy, and she is drunk with the blood of the martyrs. Question: Who is this woman? The woman represents the church. So who is this church? I'm going to give you eight identifying marks that you will not think that we are speaking against someone, but the Bible gave us guidelines to know where the errors of religious confusion comes from. The Bible says, this woman sits upon many waters. In the Bible, waters represent people, tongues, and nation. And because a woman represents a church, this church, therefore, must be a universal church. Because she sits upon many waters and many nations. Interestingly, the word Catholic means universal or general. Secondly, the Bible says that she sits upon, uh, 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 let's see that. The, 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 the beast is described in the NIV, I think I can bring that out, as having seven heads. And the Bible clarifies that the seven heads are the seven hills which the woman sits. Now, if you pick your little phone and check which city is built on seven hills it will come clear that that city is which one is rome you will find it rome has uh, is is the city in fact we can conf we can confirm that and the bible also says number two that this beast or this kingdom them were the pontiffs of rome when constantine left he gave his seat to the popes well you can read that later 
And uh, okay, the, back to Revelation 17:9. The seven heads are the seven hills which the woman sits. And I was interested in the language and the tense in which the Bible speaks. John speaks in the present tense. It means at the time we are going to speak, this church, this woman will be based in Rome. Those are good identifying marks. The other identifying marks is the fact that it's a woman on a beast. A beast represents what? A nation. Is that right? A kingdom. A woman represents what? So this is a child drunk. This woman is drunk with the blood of the saints. That represents persecution. So you can tell that if we can find a church and a state that persecuted people. And friends, you can check that in your history. Revelation 17, 6 says that the woman was drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs. So it must be a persecuting church. I don't know if you can remember Pope John Paul in 1992. He came out publicly and he apologized. You know, they persecuted over 50 million. They killed 50 million Christians in the Dark Ages. Go check something called the Inquisition and you will read it and find out. And that actually forms part of their relics in the dress. I'm going to explain to you something here. It's a photograph of why the Pope wears red shoes. I can bring it close so that you confirm. The answer it can be gotten from them. They say... Uh, this is uh, Lawrence Cunningham, professor of theology at the University of Notre Dame. He's considered a, a master of Catholic trivia. He knows all these things. And he says, this dress of the Pope is not just unusual. Uh, he says, the red color commemorates what? Read it out there. The blood of martyrdom, the shedding of blood. And the new Pope's outfit will be a skirt of ivory wool, a white cassock with sleeves of 33 buttons representing... <laughs> Jesus age. You know, there's some nonsense in this world you don't want. Eh? And then it says, he will also wear a skull cap with something else. Read that. A red pair of what? Red leather shoes. What does that red leather shoe? I don't want that mosetta. The six pairs of red shoes represents the color of blood of the martyrs. They own it. Ask it. Ask them. They will say they did it. Check their churches and they are building now large cathedrals and inside there are dungeons where you will be persecuted. Friends, as I speak here, these things are shocking and threatening. And one of these days, I will be whisked away to die and I'm ready to die. But they don't, don't think that I'm, I'm afraid. I am not afraid. Soon they will say this is hate speech. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? But I must tell it to you in good time so that you make your decision in good time. I made mine for me. I am saved if I am die, I'm dying. You know, they, 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 did, they did funny things with the, mat, with the matters. They would pick someone with their children and they take them. They, would, they dug holes and they put spikes of iron in those holes, eh? like nails, iron nails. And then they pick one child and they ask him, do you still believe in the Bible? And Jesus, they didn't want anyone to read the Bible. They would throw them down and the child would shriek. And they asked the parent, do you still believe? They would call you a heretic if you preach the Bible and not what the church said. And Paranero, following after the same spirit of uh, persecution, would take the Christians and bind them and pour some oil on them. And he would use the Christians to light his garden light, uh, garden at night. Friends, get to know this is serious business. I have left my own scarlet. Now, some of you, if you are not having a problem of color, you can check purple there. Those are the official colors of their card cardinals. That is their color. God gives all the way marks. The Bible also says that apart from that, she has a cup in her hand. But, uh, no, no, before the cup, she is decked with gold and precious stones. She doesn't want you to hear these things. And it's the devil. It's not the church. It is serious, and he does this all the time. It's not the first time. But God wins, and someone will come to see Jesus because you just didn't know. The day I heard these things, my heart burned, and I said, why are people in error? I am going to Jesus. Can I move on? I think you can see, praise God, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. You know, this represents the wealth of Rome. Some of you think that China is wealthy. I am telling you, go do your research well. Vatican is the wealthiest of all nations. Rome's wealth is beyond computation. Come to Nairobi and get to a town, an area called Karen. It is the highest estate of the city. And almost all of it is owned by them. 
They have economic muscle to do anything they want to do anytime. And they are working under the work, the plan of the devil. Then this cup is the one I want to finish with. He has, she has a cup, a golden cup in her hand. But inside the cup, let's look at the wine cup. It has filthiness, it has abomination, and it has fornication. This wine cup of Babylon, what does it have inside? Do you see that cup in this picture? Well, that wine cup, I can bring it closer so that you see it. It's not the literal cup, but it has many errors that many people have followed and they have ignored the Bible. And most of even other churches, they follow without knowing things that Rome is the one who brought into Christianity. Let's read from a Catholic uh, cardinal. He's called Cardinal John Henry Newman. He writes in his book, The Development of Christian Doctrine, page 372. He said, we are told by Eusebius that Constantine, in order to recommend the religion of the heathen, he transferred into it all the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed to in their own, in their own religion. What are those outward ornaments that Constantine brought into, he brought into Christianity? Number one, the use of what? Uh -uh, you guys, you don't want to read. The use of? Dedicated to Saint Andrew, Saint Veronica. That thing is not in the Bible. There is no uh, temple dedicated to Saint whoever in the Bible. It is a pagan doctrine. And then the use of candles. It doesn't matter what you use the candles to do. That thing is pagan. And take it out of church. The use of holy what? Somebody asked about it, that's why I highlighted. Then processions, you know processions? Processions and the people following, following. And then the ring in marriage. Let me talk about that. Can I just suppose that with Isaiah chapter 3 from verse 16 or you don't want preaching? I stop preaching. Those of you who are married, can you doubt that I'm married without a, a, a ring in my fingers? And today's young girls have become so forward that those with rings are the ones they're looking for. Rings don't protect marriages. If you want to protect your marriage, buy for your wife a German shepherd. That thing is pagan. Praise God. You are angry with me. Turning to the east. I used to do that, man. I know these things. And then, <laughs> later date, all these things are at pagan origin. I can read some more. I have some more things to say here. Let me see if I can say some more. Now, Christianity became established an established religion in the Roman Empire, and it took the place of paganism. But it came with all those things that was in paganism. They just baptized each of those things inside. For example, one of the things that was in paganism was a guy called Dagon. If you go read the, these books I'm putting up there in the book of Judges and uh, First Samuel, Dagon would have a problem with the Ark of God. So when the Ark of God and Dagon were put in the place, same place, the next day you find God has fallen. Now <laughs> he's bowing to the God to Yahweh. It's a very interesting story. But friends, that thing called the fish of Dagon has been used, has been carried, and it has crept into the Church of Rome. You can look at their hearts. Eh? Can you see how Dagon was looking like? <laughs> There's something fishy about that heart. The open fish mouth is what they are using. Sometimes when they have known that people have known, they stop using it. The second something that is in the, that wine cup is, uh, maybe I could talk about some other false doctrines that are in that wine cup, is the sprinkling in baptism. Because they wanted to, to baptize those people who didn't want to go into water, and they said, no, the king wore a very rich robe, so let's sprinkle him. But friends, the Bible says, anybody who needs to be baptized must die, must be buried, and must resurrect. And that is the symbolism of baptism. So sprinkling came in, and today most churches are drunk with that wine of Babylon. And friends, I ask you, if you are baptized by sprinkling, you have not been baptized. You are still a pagan. You need to cross over. The other one is image worship. Today most churches are drunk with this also. You will find a lot of images, images of gods and goddesses. Here's an example of the Greek goddess called Ashtoreth. They just imported, baptized that Ashtoreth, the name Diana. And give the, the guy some small child. This child is actually Tammuz. But you guys think it is Jesus. No Jesus is there. That thing is an image. They have called her Mary, Queen of Heaven. There is no Mary, Queen of Heaven anywhere. Here's another one called the God Jupiter. This is actually, you can see the nimbus on his head. You can tell this is a pagan. And then his V-shaped fingers showing that he has power over death. 
Now that's what the, 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 the pagans used to worship. So if you go to St. Peter's Cathedral, they imported that guy. <laughs> and they named him St. Peter. And people are kissing his toe until St. Peter is almost not having a toe. I think you can tell the you know the Bible says kiss the son S O N not Saint Peter friends Rome has turned millions away from Jesus and to Jupiter to Ashtoreth to many pagan gods and they have renamed it the Bible says thou shalt not make to thee any graven images so grave image worship and the other thing the other doctrine the other wine in that cup is Sunday sacredness well, friends, this is false doctrine that came into the Christian church, and I'm going to trail it a little bit from the Catholics themselves. I'm going to read some of their books. They say, the sun was a foremost god with the heathen dom. Hence, the church, that is the church of Rome, would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name, Sunday. Uh -huh. Why should you keep it? Because that Sunday remains consecrated, sanctified, and thus the pagan Sunday was dedicated to Balda or the sun god. It became a Christian sacred day of worship. Jesus did not worship on Sunday, neither did Apostle Paul. In fact, the early church, you will find 84 Sabbath meetings in the book of Acts only. If you want those texts, I can give them to you. They say in their Catholic record, Sunday is not founded on scripture, but on what? On tradition. And is distinctly a Catholic institution. Reason and sense demands the acceptance of one or the other of these two alternatives. Either Protestantism and keeping Holy Saturday or, can I read on, Catholicity and keeping Holy Sunday. Compromise is not possible. They say Sunday is the mark. It's their mark. And it's the mark of the beast because it reveals for us that the Roman power is the beast of Revelation 13. So, of course, they claim that they are the ones who changed it. And that change is her mark in, of authority in ecclesiastical matters. Friends, let me tell you, the Lord God says today, remember the Sabbath day to keep it, to keep it holy. This thing is serious because the Sabbath is the seal of God. God has a mark. And all those legal documents with marks have three things. The name, it has the title, and the territory. And we find that in the Sabbath commandment when God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall do thy work. And then it says, for in six days the Lord, that is his name, Created, created is, is his authority and his, jurisdic uh, his jurisdiction is heaven and earth. Friends, the Sabbath is a memorial of creation. If all men kept the Sabbath, there wouldn't be an infidel or an atheist. And you can see the problems of not keeping the Sabbath. The other day, the Pope said, oh, we came from monkeys. You can see the confusion. Sunday, the, 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 the Times Magazine confirmed that. Sunday sacredness is one of those doctrines in that wine cup. I could go on and on. The immortality of the soul, I read. The pagan doctrine of the immortality of human soul crept through the back door. And I told you, the dead do not know anything. The soul that sinneth shall die. The dead know nothing. They don't return to their homes. Those are false doctrines. And I'm here to call you. I don't think I'm going to do all this. Let me just run down here. I'm left with three minutes and I'm finishing. This is serious. Let me tell you, friends, Babylon has brought so much confusion. You understand religious confusion today in many churches. And people are following without knowing. And she's called the mother of harlots. You can't be a mother if you don't have children. Her children are those churches that have followed their beliefs. Here is something that I want to leave with you to think through. This is not our seventh day at calling upon us to make a choice. And that choice is going to be difficult. God calls you to come out of her if you are God's people. And you will not receive the plagues. When you come out of Babylon, where do you go? Don't go to any other church that teaches all these things that we have mentioned. Here's the last one from St. Catholic's, Catholic's Church Sentinel. He says, People who think that the scripture should be their sole authority. Let me pause there and ask, is there anyone here who thinks the scripture should be your sole authority? Can I see your hand? Okay, quite a, a large number. Let's read the sentence and finish. Anybody who thinks the scripture should be their sole authority should logically become seventh day, that's a Catholic talking, should become a seventh day Adventist and keep Saturday holy. Can we keep reading? The challenge issued by Rome over a thousand years remains even today. 
Either the Catholic Church is right or the Seventh-day Adventist Church is right. There can be no other choice. And that challenge, I want to post it for you as an audience today. If you want to leave Babylon, join a church that the Bible describes as the true remnant church of Bible prophecy. You know, friends, there is a story the archaeologist many years ago, they found an interesting rock in Italy. It was found so round a slab of a stone and it had a lot of speculations why, what the stone was used for. But what is, is interesting about this stone, that stone is called the old man of truth. Thank you, God bless you, keep them, them down. The next person I want to talk to and pray with, thank you, God bless you, keep them down. The next person I want to talk to and pray with for baptism, this session. This truth momentous and I want to join this church. It is of a truth I want to join. Can I see your hand? Well, you can put your hand up. We won't ask you to come up because we want to close and just go to the next session. But we want to give you an opportunity today. It's new and they want to start a new walk with you. Hold their hands and lead them all the way. Reveal these truths like you did to us, step by step. But if they should start with baptism, I pray that there will be grace poured out, that in this camp meeting, they will not miss out in the number that's being baptized just a day after tomorrow. And bless us with the gift of loving your word and following it explicitly, for I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.